Board, share screen, take a PowerPoint, and slideshow begin. There we go. Okay. All right. So you know that you have um, what? You will have a whole class on this in the spring. So a lot of this is going to be covered in more detail, but we wanted to hit some of the main ones um, that'll be covered, but it'll be great to get back when you get back in the spring, you do the, the actual semester with each one. And we spent a lot more time describing them, but the chapter does pretty well. Uh, and then what you miss, if you just, hey, I skipped him, you know, and went straight to Parasit, you would miss the immunological part. So this is what we're focusing on today is, is how uh, the parasites will evade the immune system. So they're, they're pretty tricky and we're going to focus on that and how they do that. So the mechanisms will be discussed here. So when we get to Parasit and we come back to one of these organisms and, and then you'll say, oh yeah, yeah, I know that now. That's, that's how, you know, glad, glad you reviewed it one more time so I could see how these evade the immune system. So parasitic infections is what we'll start with. And then we have fungal infections in the second half or on Monday, we don't know yet. So we'll talk about types of parasites. The immune response is key. That's what we're going to spend most of our time on. And then parasite survival strategies. That's, that's important because that's a lot how they avoid the immune system. Uh, laboratory diagnosis. That'll be some of the tests that we can employ for parasite detection. And an example that we need to talk about is toxoplasmosis. So we will focus on that. So when you look at the review material for the board, it will say, okay, in immunology, serology, you need to know something about these diseases. And it'll list the main ones like HIV. Uh, it'll list, um, you know, syphilis, those type things. And then it, and then it kind of gives itself an out. It'll say, and others. So we used to know exactly which six we needed to cover in, in serology. And then it became where when they put others on there, it was just like, oops, now, I now we don't know. It's kind of a mystery. So we don't know if we need to go in more, pick up some more, or eliminate others. So it, it kind of leaves a fog in the details there. Um, so we try to introduce them so you know at least something about each one that might pop up into the serology section of the board. Parasites. Microorganisms that survive by living off other organisms. That's the strict definition. They live off the host. They're broken up into categories. Protozoa. This is a diverse group of single-celled organisms that can live and multiply inside a human host. Helminths. These are our parasitic worms. And our ectoparasites are multi-celled parasites that live on the skin of the host. So we're going to see some semidos. Oops. Wow. See, so the slideshow is very undetailed. Your book is a lot more detailed. So let's spend a little time here going through these. So the first example, if you're following along, sorry we don't have slides that list these, but 389 is the first protozoa that we want to talk about is Giardia. Okay, so Giardiasis, Giardiasis, or Giardiosis, I don't think there's an O in it, is an example of the protozoa infection that occurs from drinking water infected with parasite. Okay, so that's our example of a protozoa. Helminths, they are, or these are known as the parasitic worms. They're multicellular organisms that can live either alone or in humans. And they include the flatworms, tapeworms, and roundworms. Ectoparasites are multicellular organisms that live on the skin. In common here are pediculus humanus humanus, right? Or cactus, that's the head lice. We have uh, Therius pubis, the pubic lice, 
and uh, sar sarcopodus scabia, scabies uh, are these that we've heard of, right? You maybe didn't think of that when I said ectoparasites. So one of the videos we had, we had some, we have some really cool videos for parasites. Remember, mm -hmm. and one of them, the one I remember showing was there was this, they put these ectoparasites on the stomach. Okay, they just put them kind of in the middle, and the scabies went down, and the head lice went up. So it's almost like they knew which region, like why do I have head lice versus pubic lice and that kind of, but this was really weird. It's put a naked guy on the video. I mean, he wasn't naked, but he was pretty much oh, naked. Sorry. He was pretty much naked, but it was fascinating to watch him like dump these on the, the stomach and see which way they migrated. And they migrated to the areas that they're found, right? So that was one of those fascinating parasite videos we watched last year. All right, some, some others include fleas for ecto, ticks, and mites. And we talked about those uh, quite a bit yesterday in, uh, in micro. All right, I'd love this. See, see we, I wish I would have, like, they would have made a great slide here. Because this, this is a great slide from, so when we think of parasitic infections, you know, from, from experience, of course, you know, ooh, it's, you know, elementary school, oh, you got scabies or something like that. I don't know if y'all played that game or not, but it, it really wasn't that, you know, head lights, yes, that's, that's still pretty relevant today. Um, even in the college level of student, I know that's, that was hard to believe, but it happened. Uh, one of our students came to class with head lights and it was hard to get rid of and it, uh, never got rid of basically she had to drop she dropped school because of head lice. just couldn't get didn't do what she needed to do um, we we advised her to shave her head if, if you can't get rid of them just shave the hair off just get it where you can get treatment she had this like thick head of hair and she just was just to, to a point she wasn't going to cut it she just wasn't going to cut it uh, so she went and got all kinds of treatments and things but she just just never could win. And we had cosmetology on like next door to MLT. And we would take her down there and say, could you check her, comb through it and see? And she's like, they're still there. The, the nits are still there. The adults are still there. What is she doing? You know, it was just, uh, yeah. So um, what was weird was we, we actually let her kind of do the hybrid uh, a couple, few years ago. We sent her home and then kind of let her do things at home. And then she would take her test and all that stuff. The other students were upset because they thought she was getting preferential treatment and she wasn't having to come to class. So she was getting to miss out on class and stuff. And I had to turn, I said, I hope you would appreciate us trying to not allow a student sit next to you in the classroom that had a head full of head lights that you could potentially get and take home. So is anybody, itching right now? Do you want to say like, that's what I was like, I was like, oh my gosh, is that, a good, uh, yeah. Uh, so that's still around. So we, we think of that, but we also think more seriously with parasites is that worldwide infection, these are deadly. Okay. So when we talk about parasites in the world, um, the, you know, it's hard saw your book talks about how with AIDS, we were seeing the decrease in parasitic infections in the United States. Um, and then all of a sudden, beginning in 81, the trend reversed. And it was the AIDS epidemic. Uh, with the decline of AIDS in the United States, the trend again just started to decrease in 96 with a 7% drop. But many areas of the world, parasites are the thing. I mean, it, it is the reason children die. Okay, so we think of that uh, worldwide. Uh, particularly in the tropic, subtropic region, rapid and unplanned growth in the cities. The WHO, the World Health Organization, reported globally one third of all deaths are caused by infectious and parasitic disease. In 2010, malaria alone, so we're going to talk about malaria today. Malaria alone 
is the underlying cause of death for 1.2 million people in the world in one year, including more than 700,000 children under the age of five. Over 520,000 people age five or older uh, were in that number. So whereas malaria, tuberculosis, and HIV are well known for their impact through the world, there are others that are kind of neglected because they're not into the, hey, we got to do something about those, right? So we see a lot about malaria. We see mosquito nets, those kind of things being distributed. Um, just sleeping with a net around your bed can decrease your chances of getting malaria. Uh, to um, vaccinations, developing vaccinations for malaria. But there's others, and you'll, we'll cover these in, in the next semester. We got leishmaniasis, schistomoniasis, uh, snail fever, African trypanosoma, sleeping sickness, um, ocho, uh, ocherius, uh, river blindness, lymphatic filarius, elephantitis. Okay, and but those are the kind of tropics, subtropics. And then we have in the United States, we have trichomonas, we have giardias, we have cryptosporidium, we have toxoplasmosis, or our common. So if you wanted to know the ones that you need to kind of highlight for us, it's trichomonas, giardias, cryptosporidius, and toxoplasmosis. So how does the immune response respond, right? How does our body respond to parasites? Well, first off, we have our innate, right? We're very familiar with our innate defense and we really appreciate our phagocytosis. We produce our, we appreciate our cytokine production. And then we get into some other areas of adaptive immunity. We were talking about IgE antibody and ADCC. Does anybody remember what ADCC is? You know, anti is it antibody? Yeah, antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity, ADCC cells. I think we had that, that last test or test before. I think they showed up before. And then your possible outcomes, just to kind of set the tone for our discussion, eradication of the parasite. That can be one thing your immune system can do. You can die. That's another thing can happen to you. Or you can establish a persistent infection where it's chronic, goes on for years, okay? That you and the parasite just kind of get along for a long, long time. So let's take those apart. Let's look at our immune response. Anything from hematology? Did y'all have a hematology test this week? Anything from hematology that y'all know about with parasites? I'll have a test next week. Which cell, which white blood cell is connected to parasitic infections? Eosinophils. Eosinophils. Good. Good job. That's great. Okay, so the red dot cell, right? Same as the red dot. You see them all over, right? Could be a reason. Increase in eosinophilia would be a parasitic infection. So when the organism in, encounters a host, the eventual outcome depends on a variety of factors, your book says. It includes a number of organisms. That would be like the size of the inoculum, the multiplication rate of the organism, and the virulence factor that organism possesses. Those are a couple of things that will help determine how the host is infected. So table 22.1 shows that you have potential outcomes of the host. You can have natural resistance where you get no, no invasion. I don't think we have. No. We'll get to survival. You have symbiosis, colonization of the host and with the parasite and there's a benefit to both. You have commensalism, again, repeating these words that you need to know the definitions of. Colonization of the host with the parasite with no benefit or harm. So 
So symbiosis, great. We're both benefiting. Commensalism, you know, you're here, but you're not harming. There's no benefit or harm. Sterilizing immunity. The parasite invades a host and causes the disease and the host develops immunity and is cured. So a sterilizing immunity where we get rid of the parasite. We have con commitment immunity. So that's a new word, right? Parasite invades a host, causes disease. The host develops an immune response and there's some resistance to the parasite, but it's not cured. And then there's ineffective immunity where the parasite invades the host, causes disease. The host does not develop resistance to the parasite and is not cured. So those are kind of the outcomes of our parasitic infections. So what does the parasite do to survive? So the parasite can conceal its antigen. So if the immune system can't see the antigen of the parasite, then there's no response. Plasmodium does this, the one that causes malaria, it says. The parasite does what? It stays inside the host cell. Does anybody know what host cell it invades? Plasmodium. Hematology, red blood cell inclusions. Ring a bell? Y'all got the red blood cell inclusions? Yay. Zoom, have y'all gotten the red blood cell inclusions? They're not going to say anything, are they? And Rachel says yes. Okay. So yes, malaria, malarial parasite, you can see inside the red blood cell. If you stain it, it's going to show up kind of weird. It's going to be hanging in there. Okay, so that concealment keeps the immune system from responding. The parasite can vary their antigen. Trypanosomes do this. They alter their surface glycoproteins by gene switching. Leishmania, which have complex life cycle forms. So they change. They have hundreds of genes and they kind of express when they want to express. So they have this way of changing by gene variation. So what it says on 391, it says that the first mechanism involves parasites ability to generate a novel antigen by random mutation. So the actual parasite is mutating. Some parasites have evolved mechanisms which random mutations occur with frequency sufficient to evade the immune system, All right? So if the antigen's always changing, then whatever immunity you built up the first to the first antigen is no longer valid for the change. So thus it evades immune response. The second mechanism is an antigenic variation that occurs through genetic recombination, rearranging the genes. So there's a new epitope on the surface of the parasite, which the previous immune response is not ready for. So this says the rearrangement is another way Plasmodium falciparum and Trypanosoma cruzi have their way of changing. And let's see, Heather went through parasite, right, Heather? Yeah, so if we have any problems with any names or we want to know anything about the life cycles of any of these parasites, she is ready to roll, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, the third mechanism, that gene switching, and this is the most dramatic form, it says, the gene switching, uh, is dramatic form of antigenic variation that the parasite can do. They carry upwards to 1,000 different genes and they can just kind of switch them around, switch them on, switch them off. And they express the example here are the trypanosomes, which your book says they alter their surface glycoproteins by gene switching. Trypanosoma gambanese E and trypanosoma rhodaense. These organisms are able to alter their surface 
thus evading the immune system. The last one, antigenic shedding. The parasite sheds their surface antigen, which bind to the host antibodies in the cell. All right, that's kind of, and when I think about shedding my antigen, I kind of think of the evasion. You know, you've seen these in the movie where, oh, there's, you know, land a surf or land a air missile headed to the airplane that the star's riding on, right? And they like shoot out from the back of the plane, these like other little things that are supposed to attract the missiles away from the main plane and blow up, you know, and it always saves the day. Y'all remember, y'all ever seen a movie like that? Movie scene? Yeah. Usually the president's on that plane when they do that, right? They're trying to save the president from getting shot down. No. Okay, that's what I think about antigen shedding is like, hey, you're attracted to something I have on me and I'm just gonna kind of let it go. And then you can attack it out away from me, but it's not gonna do you any good because I'm still good. You've missed me. And entamoeba histolytica does that. Do these names sound fun, right? So it's like a preview of what's coming next semester, right? Recognize all you recognize them good so we also have mimicry so here's the antigen sheddings on 392 just kind of like how a bacteria sheds its capsule you know the uh, entamoeba histolytica can do that it sheds its antigen from its cell surface antigenic mimicry this is where the parasite expresses epitopes that are similar or identical to host molecules, right? You want to fool the immune system, look like the host. So the antigenic mimicry occurs when the parasite expresses their epitopes similar or to identical to the host molecules. The similarity between the host and the parasite antigens may suppress the immune response and protect the parasite from being recognized and eliminated. An example here is the schistosoma. So schistosoma species is the one here that would do the mimicry. The immune response is results of the host, the parasite cross react, which may lead to autoimmunity, manifesting autoantibody. So it could be a problem, right? So this is where we think about invading an antigen invading, and then it ends up being, now I'm attacking the host tissue because you look like the antigen I saw and there's similarity between the two and we get an autoimmune. We talked about that with autoimmunity. Immunological sub, oh no, we missed diversion. Where's diversion? Diversion is after sub Okay, immunological diversion. Is it right on the PowerPoint? No. In the book, subversion comes first. I know, but are the definitions the same? I was just checking my PowerPoint here. It's achieved by avoiding the effector for yes. their bright. Okay. Which one do you want to do first? We can do the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint first. All right, immunological diversion. The parasite induces production of proteins that divert the attention of the immune system. So kind of like the, uh, what? Oops. Kind of like the shedding. Here, we're gonna just go ahead and produce some proteins to try to throw you off. Uh, Plasmodium falciparum infects the red blood cell. It induces B cells to divide and differentiate into plasma cells. Is that an example of immunological diversion? Let's see how that, that doesn't read real good. Let's see how it looks in the book. We're doing diversion first, right? Parasite causes immune system to produce proteins that divert the attention. Oh, okay. Does that make sense now? So the immune, the body is producing the protein. So it induces that production. The parasite's not producing those making the body produce the proteins, which induces B cells to divide and differentiate in the plasma cells. So how's that helping? It diverts the attention. 
The example here is the ability of parasite to cause an increase in production of beta interferon, which allows for increased parasite survival. Interferon beta has been shown to decrease the ability of the macrophage to kill Leishmania. The exam didn't really give that as the example, did they? What about subdiversion? Parasites produce proteins that act as homologous of immune system components, complements, cytokines, FC portion of the antibody, and human leukocyte antigen. So they subvert the immune system is achieved by avoiding the effector mechanism of the immune response. T cells by producing the cytotoxic T cells producing a decoy HLA molecule. <coughs> they also subvert the FC function of the antibody by making FC receptor homologous as they can subvert. So Right? If I can make components that look like parts of your immune system, that's pretty, pretty smart, right? You wouldn't bind an FC portion of me if I stuck it out there if it looked like the FC portion of antibodies. Makes sense. Okay. So very, very, I didn't know if you knew that much about parasites and how they avoid. That's a pretty good wrap of how parasites avoid the immune system. So let's look at laboratory diagnosis of parasitic infections. This looks pretty similar to things we've seen already. We got a Binax now malarial test. Got a control line, a test one, a test two. Um, we got uh, we got, what are all these? We got a negative, get, uh, I'm going to pull on Heather for a little bit. PV, PM, and PO. PF or mixed, PF. For malaria, you want to give, give the breakdown of malaria for them? We never did this test in the lab, did we? No, we were too busy looking for plasmodium. Do you remember all the little the names after the P? It was, uh, <laughs> we have, I think we have this picture in here, right? Yeah. Where is it? There it is over there. It maybe helps us out. We got the other names over there. I know that Falciparum looks like a banana, right? Yeah. yeah, we have a picture of that. <laughs> we have a picture. I don't know if I have a slide, but I know I have a picture. Where is it? There it is. Or no, that's not it, is it? That's Toxo, sorry. Thought I had a picture. All right, go ahead. Give me the names. Where is it at? It's down under the No, you're my parasitologist. You're... Give me, you said falciparum for F, yeah. Plasmodium falciparum. What about uh, PV? Plasmodium what? Putting her on the spot. Somebody help her out. Vivax. Vivax. Yeah. Remember that one? Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, O. What about O? P O. O Valley. Yes. O Valley. We got one more. We got M. Right? We never looked at them like that, though. We went through all these names. Not by two letters. No, but this okay. is a test. This is a malarial test. Yeah. So I don't remember seeing this though in PowerPoints or anything. No, no, this is there. I wouldn't, yeah, this is immunology. So. Yeah, we, we had all the names. Remember, we had a whole slideshow of names. I mean, now that they're said, I remember. Now you see them. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, so we do, we can do what we did in Parasit, which was what? Look at the first line microscopic detection, right? And that's, we just got good news, right? I just got my quote back from Puerto Rico and we have almost, so you know where your money's going. I like to do this. So you know where your money's going. Almost $900 worth of parasites coming for next semester. Yeah. 
That makes me really sad for me to party back there. Because we got all of this stuff that was left. Well, I didn't know about the Puerto Rico supply chain, but now I do. There's a, there's a, there's a company in Puerto Rico that supplies parasites. You're going to have like all kinds of good stuff. 44 miles. Brand new. So it's going to be sweet. Just to get y'all excited about this. So we're going to microscopically look for these. Okay. We've got good stuff coming. Okay. We're ready to retire the other. Oh, and uh, he was really concerned when we said, hey, we're retiring our old supplies. And he's like, no, 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 you don't have to do that. He said, just put revive them with, I've got the formula. You can put that in there and they'll come back. They'll be great. I'm like, no, we're ready to retire. <laughs> Damn, my students were ready to shoot me a few times last semester. They were like, we have looked on this slide for at least 30, 45 minutes and I still don't see anything, right? Oh, there's one right there. Like one out of a One out of us. Yeah, you're supposed to see about six to eight per drop. So just drop it on the slide and look at it. You should see what we're wanting to see. So it's going to be great. Uh, we can also do molecular assays looking for uh, the parasite itself. That's cool. And serological methods, and this is where we have come in, where we look for antigens or antibodies, and that's what this test over here is. It's the most useful when detecting a parasitic agent that's difficult or not possible. Okay, so, um, so we want to see if the body has responded. So we can look for antibodies or we can search for antigen determinants based on the samples. So these are pretty rapid. Uh, kind of like what you've been doing so far. So you've got rapid antigen detection called lateral flow assays that we're real familiar with. And I don't know, we might go searching in refrigerators, see if I can come up with something uh, to the parasitic immunology. Not so sure if I have that or not. Eliza, you see on here. And where I am is 395, 396, sorry, 396. We came over to the serological. I did want to say there is limitations, it says. Limitation, we're going to, then it kind of backtracks a little bit into toxoplasmosis. So let's kind of stay here. As with all laboratory testing, love that. It is important to use methodologies that are most straightforward and cost effective for each test. However, it is also important to consider the specificity sensitivity of a method when choosing a procedure. Have y'all heard those two words put together with COVID testing since March? Anybody? Specificity and sensitivity. Some tests are more sensitive than others. All right, some more tests are more specific than others. Uh, currently, there is no external proficiency testing program offered in the area of parasitic serology, except for one, and that is the diagnosis of toxoplasmosis. So when you see that last, most useful when detection of parasitic agent is difficult or not possible, then we use the serological group. But what that means is, is that we don't have any, hey, if you're doing this test in the lab, you need to make sure you're proficient in it and we'll send you samples for you to test that for. The only one we have is for toxoplasmosis. So you really have a hard time evaluating commercial assays and that are currently available. And the commercial kit manufacturers must obtain FDA approval before selling their products. FDA requires only that a new method be equivalent to a method that has already been approved. And we deal with this kind of like in Washington too, because we deal with lab developed tests. So a lot of times we have one test that does pretty good about picking up things. And then we go, oh, we can use that for something else. We use it in a different way. FDA is, Sometimes doesn't like that, right? So we, we were getting word um, a couple of years ago that FDA was going to 
put a little more regulation into lab developed tests. And they were going to have to come from a commercial manufacturer that got approval uh, from the FDA to put that out. We kind of put the halt on that. And then now that we've seen COVID testing come out, FDA has been awarding emergency use authorization to just about anybody and everybody that says, hey, we think we got something that works. Okay. They're like, well, okay, go put it out there. You know, that's how a lot of this COVID testing got out so quick was that's the only way it got out so quick. So we were way behind and then we caught up really quick, but then there was concern are we actually being accurate, right? That's still a concern today, those of us that have gone through the testing and seen the results. All right, so let's finish up. We'll spend our last minute. So it does look like we're going to be able to divide in half the lecture. I have a quick question. Yes. On this test right here, why are PV, PM, and PO all in the same? Like, can they be treated with the same thing if you've got one of those three, or do you then have to go on and determine what they've got? Well, I would guess, I would guess that here, this is telling us that we're positive for plasmodium falciparum or a mixture, okay, with in this well. So the antigen, the antibodies is what I'm thinking we're looking for is that they've been developed and they would be, you would be useful for either of these, either one of these um, varieties of plasmodium. So here you get a negative result, meaning they have not produced any antibodies. And I guess this is an antibody test, does it say? Yeah. It targets the assay targets the histidine rich protein 2 antigen specific. Okay, so it's looking for antigen. So this is, so they would if impregnate this with antibody, this will be screened for antigen. So it's specific for falciparum and the pan malarial antigen common to all four. So one of those antigens they're putting on here is common to all four species. That would be ovale, falciparum, malaria, and um, what was the last one? Valvax. Valvax. So I'm taking that to mean uh, T, I don't know if it's T1 or T2. So basically, you would take your EDTA whole blood, since these are in the red blood cells and you would load this, looking for those antigens. And I'm sure there's probably a processing of the red blood cell to lyse it and free these up so you can test for them. But I've never done one of these, so I don't, I don't know the details to put it out. We didn't have it to run in parasitology. But good question. So let's finish with toxoplasmosis. Has anybody heard of toxoplasmosis? Protozoan of Toxoplasma gondii. We get it from ingesting raw or insufficiently cooked meat. We ingest the oo, is it oo cyst, right? Oo cyst? I think we said oo cyst. Oo cyst, they want to go with oo cyst. In cat feces, has anybody heard of this now? Well, we only have one with children here. So what was when you were at your doctor and you were pregnant and they told you you were going to have a child and they asked you, did you have any cats at home, right? Did they ask you that? That's how I got the uh, kitty litter. Um, well, they didn't really, I don't guess they asked me if I had them. They just, if you have a cat, don't change the litter box. Yes. Have someone else do it. So that's how I got that uh, chore at my house and still have it today, changing cat litter. For 18 years, I've been changing cat litter. Because when my wife was pregnant, I already knew this. So I was like, oh, you can't change the cat litter. Because the cat can have infected with Toxoplasma gondii cyst in their poop. Okay, and they shed that into the cat litter. 
and then you go change it. And then if you're pregnant, you get infected with it. Okay, so it's not, it's not something we hear a lot about, but it is a cautious way of making sure you don't get um, infected. So we'll learn a lot about the transmission of toxoplasma because we'll talk about tachyzoites that cross the placenta to the fetus and then the fetus becomes infected and that's not good. Okay, so that, that's our concern when we think about it. So here is the life cycle. This is preparing you for next semester. This is where we love to stay on um, how everything works out. So here's the human over here, right? We said the human can be infected by eating undercooked pork, okay? The human can also drink or eat if it's been feces contaminated, okay? So we can, we can have these harbored in our uh, pigs or our sheep, it looks like. It affects our brain, our eyes, our heart, and a developing fetus. So how does the cat play, right? How does the cat play here? So if the cat's at your house, right? And the cat is uh, shedding oocyst, right? So these are unsporulated, kind of like a seed, if you want to think about it. So they're unsporulated. Then they sporulate, right? And that sporulization, that tachyzoite, now can in infect the mouse. And then the mouse becomes a chronic infection and the cat eats the mouse and that's how the cat got it. So there's this a circled life cycle of the current, like infected, shedding, reinfecting, eating, shedding, reinfecting. So that, that Toxoplasma gondii has a way of what? Surviving. So it's surviving not only in a cat, but a mouse and it keeps going over and over. But those sporulated oocysts can also be brought in if the feces is in the grass and in the feed or over wherever the cats may be pooping or the mouse be hanging out. Then these other things get infected with Toxoplasma gondii and then we can either ingest it. We can either eat food that's got feces contaminated or drink water that's been feces contaminated. So that's kind of the, the life cycle of Toxoplasma gondii. So we want to avoid this. Okay, so we see this, but we also could see this. So not washing things when you get them from the grocery store um, and definitely cooking food to a certain extent, not eating raw would definitely help us there too. And y'all thought it was we were eating cats, right? Is that what y'all thought? Is that how y'all thought we were getting it? Just see if y'all were awake. Okay. All right, so the incubation is five to 23 days. Healthy people are usually asymptomatic or have a mild lymphadenopathy. The immunocompromised patient, this is a key. There is a reactivation as a result of a rupture of a tissue cyst then it invades the central nervous system and causes encephalitis and it can be fatal. So we definitely have seen that in our immunocompromised patients. Congenital infection, this is the fetus. The fetus can be a miscarriage, a stillbirth, or mental defect, deficiency, deficiency, is that it? Deficits, mental deficits. And then there, the risk is higher in the third trimester. So, oh, you know, we've made it this far and everything's hunky-dory and I'm just going about my regular day and just getting in, changing that cat litter again. And then we get a mom that gets infected with it. So we can do serological testing for toxoplasmosis. And this will determine whether we have a current or past infection. And you are very aware of this. If IgG is positive and IgM is negative, that means we have a past infection. If IgG is negative and IgM is positive, that could indicate an acute infection or a false positive, it's always a possibility. Collect a second sample from the patient two weeks later because that's when we expect IgG to come up. 
If IgG is positive, IgM is positive, that indicates possibly a re -infe recent infection or a false positive, perform an IgG avidity test to determine the cause. So this is you, you are ordering this. So all of a sudden, we want to see if we've gotten a toxoplasmosis infection, and then you're able to order both, right? It'll say, you go in there and it'll say, I need an IgG and an IgM for toxoplasmosis, a toxoplasma Gandhi, and you have, we hope you would be able to interpret the results and you just wouldn't send that out when you got it in. Because so some of this has you redoing and retesting. Any questions on the serological test? All right, so we're going to stop there. We'll pick up fungal on Monday and finish up. So this is the last chapter. So look for a quiz to pop up probably this afternoon late. And uh, now that I know all the chapters we'll cover, we will cover through 22 for the exam on Wednesday. Huh? No, I didn't mean to. I don't. I don't ever mean to call you like that. All right, we're going to end. Well, some people would get mad at me for doing that. I mean, we're going to stop the share. We'll see you later, Zoom. Have a good weekend. Thank you.